You're listening to the Sunday podcast from Life Point Church in Santan Valley, Arizona. We hope you are encouraged by today's message. For more information, visit us online at lifepointaz.com. Uh, grab a Bible, open up to 1 Corinthians. Would you? 1 Corinthians chapter 3 as we continue our study and our devotion to the scriptures. I had mentioned last week that we're in the middle, uh, that I've read this book that came out a couple weeks ago by Francis Chan called Letters to the Church. I believe we've got about 15 copies here this morning that we ordered, and if you want to buy one, uh, we're just, they're 10 bucks, that's what we paid for them, and you can pick one up out in the lobby on your way out. I encourage you to do it. Uh, obviously, there's only 15 of them, so not everyone will get one, but if you have a device that you like reading it on other than paperback, you can do that. But I encourage you to pick it up not because it has all the answers, but because it forces you to think. It's forced me to think. It forces us to evaluate and examine our hearts on what is church. And this morning's message, one God, one church, one goal, is essentially Paul's message in 1 Corinthians 3. As he's laid the framework and he's addressed the issues with the people of Corinth, he's now come to the point where he's reminding them, what is church? And there couldn't have been a more beautiful time for Chan to release his book and for us to be in this part of 1 Corinthians 3 because this is what church is, right? This, he, he's about to say, here's church. Here is church. How do you think we are doing as church, right? That's my question. That's what I have been asking myself. God, how are we doing as your body, as, as the method that you saw fit to bring the message of your son, Jesus Christ, to the world for generations to come, how are we doing? It's a pretty big question, right? I asked another question this morning. Glazed donuts or chocolate covered? Not as big of a question. I just want you to see the difference, right? There are different levels of importance in questions. Uh, while it was an important one, and if you're wondering, the answer was glazed, it's not as important as this question. There's a story Francis Chan tells in his book I want to read it to you here, and he's talking about church. He's talking about specifically sort of the American church and uh, a little bit of what he has viewed, what he took part in when he was a mega church pastor, and then tells this story to get us to think. So I'm just going to share this story from his book. It's called The Party. He says, I asked my daughter how many kids would come to her birthday party if all we offered was cake. No games, no entertainment. They could come to the house to spend time with her, bring her gifts to celebrate her, but we wouldn't have anything else for them. She thought for a minute and said, maybe just a couple. Then I asked her how many would come if I rented out Dave and Buster's and let them have unlimited tokens, food, and prizes. She laughed and said confidently that the whole school would show up. So let's say that for her birthday, I rent out the arcade and her whole school shows up. They're all going nuts, having the time of their lives, and then imagine if I pulled her aside during the party, put my arm around her and said, look at all of these people who have come to be with you. Would she actually believe those people were there because they love her and want to spend time with her? Or would my comment be insulting? Would my comment be insulting? Second excerpt from the book. We pat ourselves on the back when we can showcase some happy families with virgin children who don't swear. Can we just take a minute and enjoy that? <laughs> like, that was me. That was me. I was, I was the virgin child. I didn't swear because it was evil, and sex was evil, and so was rock and roll. We pat ourselves on the back. Man, that's so insightful. This is hardly proof God is with us and that he's not with the world. If we're able to look objectively, we could see why the average person is not banging on the front doors of our church buildings. If Muslims were advertising free donuts and a raffle for a free iPad as a means to get people to their events, I would find that ridiculous. It would be proof to me that their God does not answer prayer. If they needed rock concerts and funny speakers to draw crowds, I would see them as desperate. And as their God, he is cheap and he is weak. It's pretty, uh, 
inward, inward focusing, right? Taking a minute and going, hmm. Now, just so we're clear, because I can already see it happening, our pastor said Christian concerts are evil. No, I didn't. Our pastor said giving away free things is evil. Nope. But it does cause us to take a minute and say, when it comes to church, and I'm, my mic's hot. If you don't hear that, I'm just getting a lot of bad news. If it doesn't cause us to stop and say, church, what is the main point of church? What is the main point of this gathering here today? There's over 350 of us roughly in this room right now, plus another probably 150, 200 kids. What is the point of this time here? I've been asking myself that a lot. Are we doing it right? Does our time honor the Lord because we gave him 20 minutes of music? We received an offering that we hope to use to further the kingdom. I'll give a message here over the next 30 minutes, and then we'll take communion and leave. Are we doing it right? And I don't want to be the only one asking that question. I want, I want all of us, because... I'm not the church, amen? We're the church, collectively. We're the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. Let's, de let's devote ourselves now to the reading of the apostles. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly. You see, you're mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You're still worldly. There's still jealousy and quarreling among you. Are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere carnal humans? For when one says, I follow Paul and another Apollos, aren't we just human beings? What after all is Apollos? What is Paul? I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God is making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who brings the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor, for we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. Pay attention to those words. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and then someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay a foundation other than the one already laid by Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what we have if what has been built survives the fire, the builder will receive a reward. If it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss but will be saved, even if only saved as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred and you Together are the temple. Do not deceive yourselves. If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, then I encourage you, you should become fools so that you may become truly wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise and their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours, whether Paul, Apollos, Cephas or the world, life or death, present or future, all are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is God. This is the word of the Lord for us this morning. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? God, without your spirit, these are just words. Without the one you sent to hold it accountable, these are, this is type, this is code in a computer, but God, with your spirit, it is life everlasting. It is the very power of who you are. 
And so, Lord, we don't take that lightly this morning. As we read these words, I pray that it would penetrate the hearts of those who came in, as Josh was saying, with junk, who are broken, and that we would realize the power. In Jesus' name, amen. So Paul paints three pictures of the church here, right? Three pictures of what the church is. The church is a family, first of all. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 1 through 4, the first four verses, he talks about it being a family. And the purpose of that family is to grow towards maturity, right? From milk to meat. The second picture he paints is from 5 to 9, and he says the church is a field, and the goal is quantity, is growth, is expansion, right? And then 9 through 23, he says the church is a temple, And the goal of the temple is quality. Quality. How is the temple being built? We already know what the foundation is. What is being built upon it by those who come after? So I want to ask you a question because if you're like me, you've probably heard the statement before, the milk and the meat of the gospel, right? Have you heard that before? Paul, well, you just heard it now, so... You heard me say it. Paul said, look, I couldn't give you the meat because all you could handle was the milk. And obviously, you still can't handle the meat because you're jealous and you're quarreling amongst each other and you fight over ridiculous things. I would love to bring the meat of the gospel to you, but I fear that like a baby, you just don't have the teeth or the ability to digest it. So I have a question for you. What is the milk and what is the meat? What is the milk of the gospel? What is the milk of the Bible? And what things are the meat? Growing up in the church, if I were to have been asked this question, I would have said, well, the milk is the simple things, like ask Jesus into your heart and the stories we learn on the flannel graph. It's the simple things like Bible stories, Joseph and the coat of many colors, Jonah and the well, Noah and his ark, Adam and Eve in the garden. That's all milk. It's simple stories that help us understand a bigger point. Well, what's the meat then? It's the hard stuff, the doctrine, the stuff you need to go to school for, the stuff that you need to spend hours and hours reading books with hard words that you don't understand. That's meat. Anybody else feel that same way sometimes? The milk and the meat. But I want to present to you a a bit of a different view of this. I want you to see what Paul is actually saying here when he says, I want you to get to the meat and get off the milk. Okay? Look at Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 5 and um, verses 7 through 14. Hebrews 5, 7 through 14. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, He offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And he was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. We have much to say about this, but it's hard to make clear to you, listen to this, because you no longer are trying to understand. In fact, by this time, you ought to be teachers, and yet you still need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk is still an infant and is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who by consistent use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Now, here's what's wild. This passage is essentially breaking down for us what is the milk and what is the meat. And it's saying that the milk represents that which Christ did on earth, while the meat concerns what he is now doing in heaven. You catch that? The milk is the gospel. It is him coming to earth. It is the fruition of God's will. It is the plan that has been set in place from the beginning of time. It is the mystery that God was hidden, how he was going to redeem mankind. That is the milk. Christ on the earth. 
his death, his resurrection, milk, and meat. The meat is about his priesthood, his current presence, his heavenly presence. But Paul's readers were too immature. Look, look, look at, so that was Hebrews 5, right? Look at the beginning of Hebrews 6, 1 through 3. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward into maturity, that we would not lay again the foundation of repentance, And that we would not talk again about the acts that lead to death, but that instead we would have a faith in God and that we could get to instructions about cleansing rites and the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. When we look at what the meat is, when we talk about being a Christian who is into the meat of the gospel, we are talking about a Christian man or woman who understands the concept of church. And this is why I want to I rock our worlds a little bit about our preconceived notions on what church is. What is this ministry of church all about? Well, for Paul, it involved loving, feeding, and disciplining God's family so that his children would mature in the faith and become more like Christ. In the parable of the sower, Jesus compared the human heart to soil, right? And the word of God to the seed. This is in Matthew 13 and in Matthew 18. Paul took this individual image and he then made it collective for the entire church, right? That was an individual image for a person. And Paul said, let's look at this collectively. The local church is a field that ought to bear fruit. It ought to build, it ought to bear a large quantity of fruit. That you may know that it is being planted in good soil. That the soil, good soil, just so you know this, good soil will will bear fruit even if the conditions aren't perfect. This is why the underground church in China and India is thriving. Is it because of perfect conditions? No, it's because of good soil in the hearts of those churchgoers. The task of this ministry is sowing the seed, the cultivating of the soil, the watering of the plants, and the harvesting of the fruit. That is the task of ministry. That is the task of the pastors here and the staff here and, and uh, those who have been called into a life of ministry. It is, it is not to spoon feed. It is not to um, sort of coddle. It is not to provide a place for you to come and be refreshed. It is more like an equipping It is more like us providing tools for you to then take and go out and use throughout the week. That's ministry. That's what Paul says. He says, this is the task of the minister. We'll actually get into that next week more in 1 Corinthians 4 when he really specifically talks to the teachers of the law. In fact, what we can see here is that the local, in order for the local church to produce This is what he wants to see. This is the crops he wants to yield. In Galatians 5, 22 through 23, he says the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. Oh boy, we're going to get into that too. We're going to get into the fruits of the Spirit. We're going to get into the power of God, the manifestation of the Spirit. We live in an interesting culture. We live in a culture that devours and spends millions of dollars on movies that are horror movies that depict people being possessed by demons. And we call those what kind of movies? Horror movies. It's horrifying. I can tell you if you've ever been in a room with somebody who's actually being possessed by a demon and it's manifesting, it's a lot scarier than anything you'll go see at a movie. But at the same time, if you're a son or a daughter of the king and you're in that room, you'll never, ever be able to see the power of God more prominently at work than when you can speak in Jesus' name and rebuke that demon and watch that person go from being completely in bondage to completely set free in Jesus' name. I'm telling you, you see someone in bondage, you see someone's arms and face contorting and voice, not their voice, and then you set them free in Jesus' name and you see them. You see God's creation come back. The fruit of the Spirit. Second, holiness. Romans 6, 22. That we are led to holiness. That we are called to be, uh, that we are from the world, but not to be of the world. That we are pulled out of the world. Separated. 
for his kingdom. Romans 15, 26, that we are to be giving and generous. That the fruit of God, that the fruit of the church would produce in the people, that we would give you the tools to be giving and generous. That it would be a natural outworking of God's work in your life. That it wouldn't be something that we even really try for. It would just be because of what God is doing in me, the fruit is generosity. Colossians 1.10, the good works that there would be just amazing things going on all over this valley by Christian men and women. Good works are evidence of healthy soil. Hebrews 13, 15, that we would give praises through songs and spiritual hymns to the Lord. And that our praises are an example and a testimony of the fruit. It's so neat. I kind of like when the when the uh, worship leaders step back from the mic and I can just hear it, right? You can just hear the voices of a few hundred Christians praising the Lord together, singing in unison in community. And lastly, Romans 1.13. We'll know that we have good fruit by the souls which are one for Christ. By the souls who come to know the Lord, by those who come because of the ministry and the work of the church, and they come and they say, I want what you have. I need good soil in my life. My life has been full of thistles, thorns, weeds, hard ground. And I need that soil where good things could begin to be produced. We are a building. We're a family to produce maturity. We're a field to produce quantity. And last, and where we're going to spend the rest of our time this morning is where it is temple. We are a temple individually and collectively when we gather together like this. In the book of Malachi, God's people had become bored with worship. It wasn't exciting anymore. It wasn't neat. God had set us free from our oppressors, and, and now we have learned, and we sat and listened to Apollos and Cephas and Paul in the town square. We've all got our own home church that we're a part of, where 15 to 20 people would gather, and they would do church throughout the week and be invested in each other's life. We go to the town square every couple times a month to hear one of the big guys teach, and it's just not exciting anymore. Well, as Americans, we have met this call to excitement with, a, with sort of a worldly wisdom. We've said, well, then let's do some exciting things. Let's, let's do songs that sound just like the world's songs, but we'll put a Christian message in. We'll just sort of sneak it in there. Let's invite sports stars and, ath and uh, movie stars and all these people uh, to speak on our Sunday morning in order to draw people in. And they'll be there for the Lord. Malachi 1.13. The people say to the prophet, what a weariness this has become. And our answer in our culture is to engage the world the way the world wants to be engaged. Through entertainment, through awe, through excitement, through CGI. <laughs> right? And, but this is the Lord's response. His response is somewhat different. He says this, Malachi 1, 10 through 11. Oh, that there were just one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts. I will not accept an offering from your hand, for from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name, and it will be a pure offering, for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. That's a slightly different response to church is boring. God says, you believe the church is boring? Then shut your doors. Then shut your doors. Do not give me praise. Do not feign praise. Do not pretend you are coming here to actually worship me. Shut your doors. <laughs> Turn the fire off and go your own way. 
because my name is enough awe and excitement for my sheep and my people to worship me. My glory is enough weight. Remember, glory means weight. My glory is enough weight on my people for them to be excited for the things that I am bringing in their life. My spirit is enough and the gifts and the talents I have placed on my children is enough for them to be excited. If you need all those other things, then I feel bad for you, says the Lord. Shut the doors and move on. <laughs> wow. God wants us to resemble his son, especially when we gather with our church family. So I'm going to ask you a question I asked the men Thursday night. What would it be like if Christ came out right now from the green room? And, I mean, it was him. It was him. He was glowing. He was levitating. He, he told us some things about ourselves where we all clearly knew that was him. And he came and he stood here and obviously we'd expect him to begin speaking. I would, I would fall to my face and slither off the stage and just be like, it's all yours. And what if he said, no, no, come back up. You continue to teach. And he walked down and began to wash your feet. He grabbed a bucket and a rag and he said, no, no, continue teaching, Nathan. I've gifted you in that and and I want to see you using the gifts for my name. I'm going to go and I'm going to wash the feet of my children. How would that make you feel? Unworthy? Awkward? Would you begin to weep? Would you not know how to respond to God Almighty coming to serve you? And we know that this happened to the disciples. We know that they were in a place where God, before he was betrayed, said to them, the Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve. And so I'm asking you that when I go, you would not just be admiring me. A lot of people in this world admire Jesus, don't they? Atheists, other religions, they admire what a nice guy Jesus was. And Christ said, I don't need your admiration. I need you to go and live out what I set as an example. You, he says to his disciples, go and do unto others as I have done unto you. Which means, when we gather together for church like this, we have a directive. We have a directive that we should be serving one another. Which then means, and this is the challenge I gave the men Thursday night, when you woke up this morning, the first thing you should have said to the Lord is, Lord, when I go to church today, please show me who it is I will be able to serve. I am not coming to consume. I am not coming to be filled up or fed. Those things are just going to happen by being in your presence. You catch me? Hear me on this. You don't need to try to do those things. If you're coming to church, not to consume, not to hear a good word to be refreshed, but just to come to serve, then the refreshment, the feeling, and the indwelling of the Spirit will just naturally happen. That's going to happen. You don't have to ask for it. It's like asking water to get wet when you jump in it. You don't need to. You're going to get wet. So how do we serve? Right? There's about 40-something guys here. Thursday night, and so I put that before us, and when we think of that, when we hear that, maybe some of our first response is that a new weight, a new burden is being placed on you, right? Oh, I serve my family and my boss and all of these people and my, my children, oh Lord, my children, I serve them all week. Pastor, I need this hour. I need this hour to just come and allow the Lord to refresh me. And here's what Jesus is basically saying. God promises in Acts 20, 35 that those who give will be the most blessed, that those who serve will be the most refreshed. You want the refreshment? 
You want true refreshment when you come here on Sunday morning. You want to leave with more than just a shell of a good message and a great feeling, being inspired, then you have to make it your point every Sunday. Hear me on this point. To come here to serve somebody else. And don't leave until you do. Don't leave until you do. If you want the church to be a place of rest and a place that you will be fed, this is not the church for you. It's not the church for you. But if you want to be disciples, if you want to be equipped with the tools to handle life's greatest challenges, if you want a refreshing that comes from the Lord because you are following the example of Christ and serving others sacrificially, life points the place for you. This is the place for you. This is the place to grow. This is the place to have community beyond these walls. This is the place to get involved and to be energized for what God is doing, to see manifestations of his spirit. You know, I said earlier, we fear manifestations of demons. We make movies about it. But have you ever seen a manifestation of the Holy Spirit in someone? Have you ever seen someone speak and another person be healed? Have you ever seen anxiety and fear wiped out? Have you ever felt the Holy Spirit come on a room and come on a place in such a way that it made you laugh uncontrollably where you couldn't keep it in and you didn't know why and you felt silly but you couldn't stop? If there's horror with a demon-possessed person, there is abject awe when someone is filled with the Holy Spirit. So much so that in the book of Acts we learn that Tens of thousands of people came to the Lord because of what they were seeing. And here's the other thing. Takers, people who just consume, and we're a country of consumers, they're the most miserable people on earth. Right? Well, I don't know about that. They, they are. <laughs> it's your inability to take your eyes off yourself and put them on others that is the very reason Jesus came and died on the cross. So he would give you the ability to take your eyes off yourself. I've said this before, my dad used to tell me that depression was inward eyeballs as I was a teenager and I was laying in my bed sad because life wasn't going the way I wanted and he came in and picked me up and threw me out in the living room in my underwear and then said get dressed and took me and got me a job where I was serving other people as a gross bag boy. And it got me out of my depression. I'm glad he let me get dressed first. I would have brought, <laughs> I would have brought a whole list of other problems. But have you ever been in a room full of servant-hearted people? Now think about this for a minute. Have you ever been in a room where everybody in the room was there to serve and look out for the needs of the people around them? Everybody. Is that a room of burden? Is that a room where pride and ego is sort of taking place and people are stacking themselves against one another? What do you think? No, it's one of the most refreshing places in the world to be, right? In a room full of people who are looking to serve, who are looking to meet the needs of everyone else in the room, it's a place where you just take a deep breath and you're like, oh, boy, would I love to be a consumer in a room full of givers. <laughs> I'm kidding, right? That, you should be like, oh my gosh, that's scary. A.W. Tozer wrote this, our most pressing obligation today is to do all in our power to obtain a revival that will result in a reformed, revitalized, purified church. It is of far greater importance that we have better Christians than that we have more of them. Don't you see that it's sort of weird? This is stealing this last bit straight from Chan's book, Letters to the Church. Don't you see it's weird that we call people Christians, but we aren't servants? That, that we don't serve, but we call ourselves a Christian, but we aren't serving the way Christ called us to. We admire what he did, but we aren't imitating what he did. I can't force people to serve, but there has to be something we can do. No sports team would put up with a player who wasn't following the game plan, right? Could you imagine that? 
Could you imagine on a football team if the play was to pass the ball and the quarterback just decided to run it every time? Everyone would be like, what's happening? And the quarterback would get laid out. No business would put up with a... An uh, employee who wasn't part of the goal of the company, no army would put up with a soldier who didn't carry their own weight. But why do Christians and churches continue to put up with Christians who don't serve? Yo, he did. Oh, that's awkward. <laughs> I'm going to sit down. Why don't we treat selfishness as a sin that needs to be confronted? <laughs> If Scripture commands us to serve one another, and, and we're closing on this, so I, I really want us to take this to heart. If Scripture commands us to serve one another, isn't it a bit strange that we give each other sort of a free pass when it comes to this service thing? Look, hey, if I don't serve, I won't tell that you're not serving. <laughs> Deal. First Peter 4.10, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's varied grace. James 4.17. Whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is a sin. We confront sexual immorality in our churches because we're commanded to live holy lives. And the adulterous person does not represent Christ well, right? That's why we confront the adulterer. But neither does the consumer. It's a sin that has to be confronted. And if we want to give the world an accurate, accurate representation of the body of Christ, if we really love our brothers and sisters, if I really love you, shouldn't I be encouraging us to repent? And so that's what I'm going to do as we close. That's what I want to do. One of the greatest gifts that has been given to me in my life is this calendar. Any of you recognize it? Pastor Josh gave it to me this year after I got back from my vacation in July and said, while you were gone, I asked the people of the church if they would fill out a day that they would pray and fast for you. And this is 365 days of people that I keep up in my office and I can look at and I know that there's somebody praying and fasting for me. And I can tell you that the difference that you have seen in this church and in my preaching and in our worship over the last six weeks is a direct correlation to the service and the sacrifice of people who have put their name down on here and are praying and fasting on my behalf. I'm telling you that the importance of prayer and the dedication of it, the importance of the interceding on behalf is part of service, is part of that servant's heart. And I show it to you as an example of what it means. What else would it mean to serve on a Sunday morning? I asked the Lord this and I felt like I just got some easy examples. You wanna know a real easy, sort of silly way to serve? Park the furthest parking spot out. I know it's 107 out there. What if, what if, we, what if people just saw that? What if they drove by our church and they saw that every parking spot close was empty, and all of the parking spots way far out were open. That's weird. All of the best spots are still open. Then we would also know who the sinners were. <laughs> they would come in and they would take those spots, and we could go and lay hands on their car. <laughs> There's all sorts of places in this church to serve. This Sunday morning isn't church, if you read my email. We're going to get more into this. We're not done with this. This is just the public gathering of God's saints to come and worship together. That's what this is. This is not actually church. Church is much simpler than this, actually. Church is you and a few of your closest neighbors and friends getting together weekly, devoting yourselves to the reading of the scriptures out loud, Prayer, worship, and communion together. That's church. This, the thing America calls church, is actually just a corporate gathering of the saints where we gather together once a week to worship the Lord together. My last note is this before we pray. Before you begin to serve other people, make sure you're first serving well 
in your own families. Okay? For many of us, it needs to start there. Our heart of service needs to be to our spouse, needs to be to our children, needs to be to the people immediately close to us because if we all of a sudden have these servants' hearts for everybody else and our family looks and says, what a hypocrite. They don't do anything at home, but I'm glad that they're happy to serve at the church. Then we're not representing this heart well. So I call us to repentance. As the Lord has brought me to a place of repentance, as I have looked at the church, as I have looked at the last five years of ministry and said, God, I have pursued after you with everything I have done, but if there is error, if there is a way that we could be more, that the supernatural love I spoke of last week could be evident in the way we serve and love one another, then God, help me see it. And I repent if I've done church just the way I've known to do church because it's just been the culture and it's been the tradition. Let's be more. And if that's you here this morning, if, if that, the Spirit is speaking to you on that, then I encourage you here to pray with me. Let's bow our heads. Father God, oh Lord, we need more of you and less of our programs and our incentives, our free stuff, our building, our lights. God, we're blessed to have this place. Like Robert said, we're blessed that we have a place to come together and corporately worship you. But we, if we just come in this place and consume, forgive us, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, for not treating sacred the things that you see sacred. If I call myself a Christian, I better be a servant. If I call myself a Christian... I better have love for my neighbor and those who wrong me. Otherwise, I misrepresent you, Lord. But here's the good news, Father. You tell us that in our weaknesses and in our failings and shortcomings, you uphold us. And so I need that, Lord, here today. I need to be upheld by you. Whatever God's showing you right now, I just have this sense that God is moving. I I knew he would, and as I'm speaking, I just felt like God said, just be quiet for a minute. And so I just, you talk to God, wherever you're at right now. You talk to him, wherever you're at, go ahead. Talk to him. He's your father. Go ahead, Jesus. something where you're going to come up to a prayer partner and say, hey, I've been a consumer of church for a long time. You should, but you won't. But it is something that we need to recognize collectively that God is calling us to more. And all of this revival we speak of will only happen when we begin to embrace Paul's teaching of the temple. Paul, our understanding what it means to be imitators of Christ, not just hearers of the word, but doers. So invite our ushers forward as we prepare our hearts for communion. Let that be your focus this morning. If you're a believer in Christ, if he is your Lord and Savior, we invite you to partake of communion. If not, then please just refrain. Later in Corinthians, we're going to get to the exact reason why we ask you to do that just as severe as God is in Malachi about having a church that doesn't worship him properly, there's also a severity to 
partaking of communion without the proper heart and mindset. But communion is this. The bread is the body and the juice is the blood of our Lord and Savior. Christ gave it to his disciples and asked them that whenever they gather together, they would partake in remembrance of him and what the cross means and how the glory of God came down into creation and how the mystery of how God was going to repair our relationship was foretold. So when you partake of communion today, when one of the three stations up front or three in the back, go to whichever one's closest, I'd ask that you would put that forefront in your mind. Father God, bless this bread and this juice that apart from you, Lord, is just bread and juice, but through the power of your spirit becomes your flesh and your blood. As we partake of it, God, bring a fresh remembrance. Spur our spirits on to more than just admiration, but that we would imitate who you were. Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead. You can come forward. You can meet with one of the prayer partners. You can receive communion. And we'll close with worship here in just a few minutes.